Good morning. So glad to have you here in worship with us this morning in the building and online. As a last week online worshiper, I appreciate that opportunity to be there. We also had a visitor in our last service who attended last week online, so then came to be here in person this week. So again, thank you, John Miller, for all that you do to make worship accessible to people at home and here. Um, a few announcements this morning for you. If you'll flip over to the back of your bulletin, you'll see them. Um, this afternoon at four o'clock, the bishop, Dr. Bishop Graves, is going to be down at Dolphin Way, and um, he's having a, a session for the laity, which is us, the non-clergy people in the, the district, um, are invited to go and talk to him. He has a meeting for clergy people tomorrow. Um, but this one's just for us, and so he'll speak on our level, and he'll answer questions, and um, hear what we have to say. We'll hear what he has to say about the United Methodist Church and things and um, how things are going for that. And so we don't have to have a reservation. We can just show up, and um, if you'd like to do that, that's at 4 o'clock today. I'll be there. I'll wave at you and act like I know you because it's going to be a great time together. Um, next Sunday... We're having the blessing of the backpacks and teachers. And so if you have a student in your family or in your neighborhood, you might want to invite them to come, bring their backpacks, and we'll give them a little tag. Um, we would even send your college one off to Auburn with you if you were going to be here next week. Are you going to be here? This your last Sunday before college? Max, we're so glad to see you. Stand up, Max Johnson. Max. Sorry to embarrass you, Max, but Max was playing in a huge golf tournament, and so he didn't get to be here on Senior Sunday, and we're so grateful um, for all you've meant to this church, and we wish you well as you go to Auburn Building Science. So, come back and build you a house someday, so we appreciate Max being here this week. Um, ladies Who Lunch will meet next Sunday, and a Brenda Carlisle. And Rose Johnson are going to be our hosts for that. So if you'll email Chi Chi, and her email is there for you. If you want to do that, let her know by Thursday. Um, next Saturday, the United, uh, the USA Wesley Foundation is getting ramped back up for students. We have a new director, uh, Reverend Jeremy Steele, is there. And so we're going to have a cleanup day. If you get excited about vacuuming or cleaning and that kind of thing like some of you do i've been to your houses um if you'd like to go help that's at eight o'clock next saturday and um they would love to have you help with that or if you can't do that and you want to provide a meal sometime or just bring a box of granola bars or snacks they are they think of the wesley foundation as their home away from home and so we need to have snacks and things there for them while they're away from home and um at the Wesley so if you're interested in that ever let me know I'm on the board and I can take things for you the last one is that we're collecting a love offering for Quentin McConnell he has been on our staff for six years and has a or seven years excuse me has a new job and um, he's still gonna help still gonna help us do some cleaning and things here um, but we um, are wishing him well with a love offering you can make that in the collection or you can do it online, or you can send a check, or bring a check, or whatever you'd like to do. Just put Quentin, or a big Q, on the memo, and we'll know who it's for. Um, I invite you into this time of worship, and I invite you to take a deep breath in, and let it out. Look up into the choir loft and say, oh, aren't we glad the choir is back? That lets you breathe in and breathe out that you don't have to carry all the singing this week. They're going to do some of that from up there. Let us be in a, a position and a mind of worship. I invite you to be in that place this morning.
Good morning. Please join me in our opening prayer that's printed in your bulletin. Almighty Lord and everlasting God, we beseech you to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of your laws and the works of your commandments, that through your most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now you may stand <laughs> and join it together in our hymn of praise, which is how firm a foundation found on page 529 in your hymnal. Following that, we will offer our peace be with you greeting to our neighbors. Peace be with you. Please greet your neighbors. Thanks. Oh, okay, yeah, I think so. That's right. Okay, there we go. I invite you to join me now in our prayer for illumination. 
as we prepare to hear the reading of God's Word. O Lord, you have declared that your kingdom is among us. Open our eyes to see it, our ears to hear it, our hearts to hold it, and our hands to serve it. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our responsive Psalter is taken from Psalm 50. Let us read together. God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around him. He calls the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Those who bring thanksgiving as their sacrifice honor me. To those who go the right way, I will show the salvation of God. Our Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah 1, 16 through 20. Hear now the reading. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. May God bless the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry about that, I got confused. Our epistle lesson this morning is taken from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Here now a reading from this letter. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. So that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. May God bless the reading of the word. Our hymn of preparation is number 710 in our hymnals. Let us stand together and sing faith of our fathers and our children. If there are any, are invited to join Sarah as she walks down the center aisle to go to Children's Chapel. I don't want any here. Let us stand and sing. be seated. Well, good morning. morning. It is so good to be here with you and back with our church family. It is missed you guys last week, but I did watch you online and you did a great job of worshiping God as I knew you would. Um, I was not here last week um, because of um, COVID. I'm now back to normal, as normal as I can be. Thank you, Leanne, for her nursing care. (laughs) Um, Kristen is not here this week, not because she's sick, but because she is um, completing her first round of classes at Boston University, uh, working on her doctorate in ministry program. So we um, continue to lift her in her prayers over this week. She'll be back with us on Thursday. Um, So we're looking, we are so proud of her for undertaking this um, adventure. Let's call it an adventure. Um, Also, I want to mention that at 9 o'clock at our last service in the Ascension, um, Lorraine Lynn presented um, our Thomas M. Lynn Jr. Memorial Eagle Scout Scholarship. And the scholarship went to um, Ja'Kayla Armstrong, who has just graduated from Murphy High School, where she was the varsity cheer captain, the vice president of the student government, and was a National Honor Society. And she is the first female African-American Eagle Scout in Alabama. And she will is attending uh, the University of Alabama this fall. 
She will actually leave um, this week, and she could not be with us here in the 11 o'clock service because she and her family, she wanted to go to her church, which is Liberty Missionary Baptist Church, and she wanted to spend her last um, Sunday in town with her church family. So we congratulate her and wish her well in her studies, but she will be studying kinesiology and physical therapy, so we uh, lift her up. Um, it is, um, it's good to be here. You know, I just mentioned we, I'm coming out of COVID. You know, Leanne had COVID, and then Jess had COVID, and then I got COVID. So we all three have had a second round of COVID. It's like the gift that just keeps on giving. <laughs> it's just the Energizer Bunny <laughs> taking all of our energies. Um, but, you know, as I was home for several days sitting in front of a television set which is that's what you do when you don't have any energy I got to watch a lot of news and there's a lot going on in the world a lot some of it's just sheer crazy I don't know how else to put it it's just chaos when you think about what's going on in Ukraine you think about what's now looking threatening in Taiwan and China and then what's going on in our own country, everything going on in our own community. There's just something all the time. Life is a gift that just keeps on giving again and again and again. And so I just kind of, kind of was kind of settling into this whole notion that we're always faced with something. And the question for us as a church and as followers of Jesus Christ is not so much are we going to face these things, because we're going to face them, whatever they are. But how are we going to face them? What is our response to the chaos that we live in, the chaos that surrounds us? One thing that I have noticed in these news reports over and over and over again, and, and just looking back through history, you can go back as, as far as you want to the, you can go back to when the human, humanity cast its first shadow on the face of the earth. And you will find that humanity is very clever, very artistic, very creative in finding ways to create divisions. Finding ways to create us and them, the other, whoever the other may be. We're very good at that. And so I, I have all this kind of stuff, you know, kind of swirling around in my mind and in my heart. And then today we begin this new sermon series that was planned some time ago, months ago. As Kristen and I sat down and began to think about the sermon series for August, we thought, what, a, what, what would it be like just to spend a little bit of time, just a few weeks, with the parables that are unique to the Gospel of Luke? Parables are, are wonderful, powerful little stories that reveal a truth. Some have said a, a, a very traditional definition of a parable is an earthly story that reveals an er, a, a heavenly truth. That, that may be. But we have to be very careful when we read parables. Because parables don't always act the same way. They don't always invite us into finding a character in the story that we identify with. It can. Parables can do that. But we have to look at what the parable is. As we interpret, in par interpret parables, we have to look at what the question. What is the question that Jesus has been faced with? What has been thrown at him? What, is he, what answer is he presenting? And that's what these stories by Jesus do. Now, Jesus was not the only one to tell a parable. Parables go bef have a, an existence before Jesus, and rabbis in Jesus' time certainly told parables. And, and we have parables being told today. Uh, parables are a very useful tool. I want to share one with you. This is one by one of my favorite authors. His name is, maybe you've heard of him. Um, his name is Leo Tolstoy. And this little parable is called War and Peace. And I'm going to read all sitting there. It's actually called The Stones. And I love Leo Tolstoy's short stories. I think they're just brilliant and powerful. And he offers this one 
parable. He writes, Two women came to an elder for, an, for advice. One of them considered herself a great sinner. When she was young, she cheated on her husband, and since then, pain didn't leave her. Another woman, having lived all her life by law, didn't blame herself for any particular sin and was pleased with herself. The elder asked both women about their lives. One tearfully confessed to him about her great sin. She felt her sin was so great that she did not expect forgiveness for it. But the other woman said that she does not know any specific sins. The elder said to the first one, You, servant of God, go over the fence and find me a big stone, one you can carry, and bring it. And you, he said to the one that, who didn't know any great sins, also bring me little stones, as many as you can carry. The women went out and did what the elder ordered. One brought a large stone, the other one a bag full of small stones. The elder examined the stones and said, Now you do this. Carry your stones back and place them on the very places where you took them. And come back to me. And the women went to execute the order. The first one easily found the place where she took the stone and placed it the way it was. But the other one could not recall which stone belonged to which location, and so, not completing the order, returned to the elder with the same bag of stones. So, said the old man, the same happens with sins. You easily place the large and heavy stone because you remembered where you took it. But you could not because you did not remember where you took the small stones. The same as with sins. You did remember your sin, tolerated reproaches of people and of your own conscience for it, humbled yourself and therefore relieved the consequences of the sin. But you, the elder addressed the woman who brought back the small stones, committed small sins didn't remember them, didn't repent them, accustomed to the life of sins, and by condemning the sins of others, deeper and deeper sank in your own sins. We are all sinners, and we'll all perish if we do not repent. Just a little story from Leo Tolstoy. He offers a truth in here in this simple little story, the truth that we all carry sin. And if we remember our sin, repent of our sin, we will be forgiven our sin, be relieved of that burden of sin. But when we don't, even small, seemingly insignificant sins, if we don't remember and don't repent, we will continue to gunny sack these sins to the point we become accustomed we become comfortable and we no longer remember that we are sinful. It's a powerful truth and that's what parables do. Jesus' parables are at least as important, as deep, and as meaningful as this little parable of the stones. Luke has some 20 parables in it. Another 20 parabolic sayings and some interpretive verses. So some 40 some odd stories and related material to parables. There are some 60 parables in the entire synoptic gospel catalog, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John, the gospel of John, does not use the word parable, but he does use stories. Parables are important in the way Jesus taught. They are important for the way rabbis taught. But to interpret the parable as we should, as we hear it, 
We've got to get into the story. What is the context of the story? What, what, is, what is being asked of Jesus? And what is going on around Jesus and the disciples as he begins to uh, lay out these parables? As he begins to lay out these stories that reveal the truth. Now these parables can, they can do a couple of different things. They have at least two different intentions. One is to tell us about, well, to tell us about God. God's kingdom, God's rule, God's reign in the world. What does that look like? What are the characteristics? What, what is going on in God's kingdom? What does it look like? Another intention of these parables can be to show how we are to live or not to live. They act as warnings and examples of life in the kingdom, how we're called to live as followers of Jesus Christ, as Christians, as, fa as faithful people. So as we read through these little stories, we have to find the intent. We have to look at the context and then begin to interpret what they mean. And, and as, we, as we all know in, in studying the Bible, whenever we read a scripture or a passage or a story or a parable, we can read that 20 different times over the course of our life and we'll get 20 different relevant meanings. It's the way the scriptures work. And parables are no different. As our life experiences grow and, and expand, these parables can speak to us. And as our faith develops and grows and we become deeper in our faith, these parables begin to speak to us and we begin to unpeel back the layers. And it means more and more. It's a powerful thing. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that this happens. So I want us to think about our first parable this morning, it, it comes from, the, uh, of course, the Gospel of Luke. It's in chapter 10. It's a very familiar, very familiar parable. The parable of the Good Samaritan. But for us to really kind of get in and interpret what this means, we've got to back up. But we've got to back up a good bit. Because there's a lot that's happened until this, until this parable is unleashed on the disciples and, and, and this young lawyer who's asking questions. You see, in chapter 9 and 10, the, the, the disciples are, they've seen a lot. They've heard a lot. Jesus has done a lot in front of them. He has said a lot. He's taught a lot. They have just had an, an experience of experience. And they're kind of wrestling with a very important question. It's the question that humanity has wrestled with since we cast our first shadow on the face of the earth. How do we know who we are and how do we know who each other are? How do we know whose side you're on? How do I know which side I'm on? What are the divisions that are, that are in life? What are the divisions I need to recognize or maybe I need to create so I will understand us and them? Now, there's one of my favorite television series is, is an old, old television series. It's older than I am, so it's old. It's, uh, and maybe you've watched it. It's, it was on for several years. It was very popular. And when I was in college, my friends and I, we used to watch it every day in the reruns. It was on reruns when I was in college. But it's Andy Griffith. I mean, the early ones, the black and white ones. When Barney Fife was on there. And my favorite character in the series was on there. His name was Briscoe Darling. Do you remember the Darlings? The family lived up in the hills and the mountains and they played uh, bluegrass music. It was the four boys and their, and their sister. And, and the father, the, the patriarch of the family, was played by Denver Pyle. And his name was Briscoe. What a great character. I mean phenomenal. There are a couple of, of, of cases in, in this series when he, whenever he was on there, whether he was facing Barney Fife, the deputy, or he was facing Ernest T. Bass, who wanted to marry his daughter, and they wanted nothing to do with Ernest T. Bass, he, he would ask these incredible questions. He, he would ask, he asked Barney on one occasion, they were, they were talking about Ernest T. Bass, who was a nuisance, to say the least. 
And they're talking, and, and they're talking about what they're going to do, what they need to do, what they should do, what they shouldn't do with Ernest T. And, and so they're talking, and, and, and Barney says something in legalese. He unloads this huge diatribe on the legal codes and, and what they need to do. And, and then Briscoe just stops and looks at him and says, he arguing with me? And the sheriff, Andy, says, he's agreeing with you. And Briscoe says, just so I know where I stand. Another occasion, Briscoe has come to town with his family, and they're leaving. And, and Briscoe says, I'll, I'll expect you tomorrow. And, and Anna Griffith says, well, we'll see you. And Barney Five, for some reason, says, adios, amigo. And Briscoe stops in his tracks and looks back, and he says, he one of ours? And Sheriff Andy says, sure. And Briscoe, more power to you. Briscoe wanted to know who was on whose side. Is this a friend of mine or an enemy? Is he helping me or hurting me? Is he like me or unlike me? Are we in an argument, a disagreement, or are we getting along? I just need to know. I need to know where I stand. I need to know where you stand. It's a question that's going on and on and on. It's a very similar question to the question of the disciples. When we look at chapters 9 and 10 of Luke, they're asking very similar questions. Their concerns are welling up. As they, they, they're, they're arguing at one point, late in chapter 9, they're, they're, they're traveling with Jesus and they're arguing. Who is going to be the greatest? Who will be the greatest among us? And Jesus hears them, and concerned, he lifts a child and says, The greatest among you will be the least. Like this child. That's the greatest. Just a little bit later, the disciple John begins to ask questions. What, what about this guy? There's a guy over here. He's doing the same kind of things you're doing. He's doing the same kind of things we're doing. But he's not one of us. Whose side is he on? Is he one of ours? Shall we do something about this? And Jesus says, no, hang on. If he's not against us, then he's with us. Again, when they were traveling through Samaria, James and John approached the Samaritan town, and they asked for permission to come in and let Jesus spend some time there and, and preach and teach and maybe heal people and, and just do some of this miraculous work so they can see what they've seen and they can hear what they've heard. And the, and the Samaritans say, we don't want any part of it. Just keep moving. Don't stop here. There's no room for you. Well, James and John, they just want to know. Is that, are they one of ours? Are they, are they a friend or foe? They're, they're, they're rising up against us. They're antagonistic. They've rejected us. They refused us. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn this place to the ground? And Jesus is like, whoa, whoa. Hang on. We proclaim the gospel. The gospel that the kingdom of God has come near. And we find Jesus giving the 70 disciples as he sends them out two by two. He tells them, go and cure the sick. Visit those and, and visit the towns and, and proclaim the gospel that the kingdom of God has come near. And if people refuse you, if people reject you, then leave. Shake the dust off your sandals and tell them the kingdom of God has come near. And you move on. Jesus is telling and rejoicing with the disciples in chapter 10 about all that they have seen and all that they have heard. They have seen things that, that kings and prophets have wanted to see. They have see, they heard things that kings and prophets have wanted to hear and have never, they have never until now seen and heard what God is doing as he did through Jesus Christ. Kings and prophets desired it, craved it, never saw it, never heard it. But you, disciples, you've seen it. You've heard it. Rejoice in that. Proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God has come near don't worry 
about the divisions. Don't worry about the compartments. Don't worry about who rejects you or, or who accepts you. Just proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God has come near. And while Jesus is, is doing all of this, we have this incredible little insert in chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. I invite us down to read it. It's printed in your bulletin. It's also in verse 25 of chapter 10. Together, let us read this very familiar story. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took, took off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put him, he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. And may God bless the reading of the word. Now this parable has been interpreted a number of ways. One of the early ways that the church interpreted this parable was that the man traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho was an image and a symbol for Adam traveling from the holy to the profane. As he traveled down this dangerous road, he was, this Adam figure, was jumped, abused, beaten, nearly killed by the evil powers of the world. And as he was lying in a, in a ditch near death, the law and the prophets did not help. What was expected to help did not help. But it was the unexpected Samaritan, this Jesus figure, this Christ figure, who shows up, nurses his wounds, puts him on his own animal and takes him to an inn, saves him, redeems him, and places him in the care of the church, and then promises that he will come back and make full payment. So we have this image this interpretation, ancient interpretation, that has Adam traveling from the holy to the profane, being mugged and beaten and left for dead by the evil powers of the world, not being helped by the law and the prophets, but it's Christ who comes near. It's Christ who saves, redeems, and promises to return. And that makes sense, right? I can see that. There's other interpretations. In the, th in the fourth century, John Chrysostom talked about how this is an image, the interpretation is not of an Adam figure coming down, but this is Jesus coming down from heaven, down to earth, from the holy to the profane, where the world 
will abuse him, reject him, beat him, where the expected and the chosen will not help, and it's the unexpected, the unclean, who recognize Jesus. Now, I don't know. These are all very good interpretations. And if we read this again in a year, we'll have a different interpretation. But today, what I want us to think about is to have all of this context of these disciples curious, wrestling with this whole notion of who was on our side. And what do we do with those who we perceive who aren't on our side? How do the disciples create and tear down divisions in the world? That's what's at stake. And so Jesus offers this story to a lawyer who's asking the same question. Who is my neighbor? If I'm to love God and love neighbor as myself, who then is my neighbor? Is it the person who lives in the same zip code, same city, same neighborhood, next door? Somebody goes to the same church, works in the same office building, goes to the same school, cheers for the same team, votes in the same party? Who is it? Who is my neighbor, Jesus? And Jesus launches this incredible story. And he allows this young lawyer, he allows us to find a place in it. And if we're like the lawyer, we're going to find ourselves on the side of the road. We're going to find ourselves badly beaten by the world, the evil powers in this world, and left on the side of the road half dead, dying. And that's exactly where Jesus wants the man to be found. Because then he can show this young lawyer if he was young. Maybe he was an old lawyer. I don't know. But he can show this lawyer that it's not who we always expect is our neighbor. It's not the priest. It's not the Levite. They're not your neighbor. And he asked this lawyer, who is the neighbor? And the lawyer has no other choice but to say the one who showed mercy. And Jesus tells him, yes, that's correct. Now, what's the next thing Jesus has to do? Go and do likewise. What this parable does, what most parables do, is in, allow us to enter this simple little scene, this simple little story, and find us something truth in there, and that truth turns everything upside down. Now, all of a sudden, this lawyer and us, if we're honest, if we're intentional, it allows us to no longer look for who's going to help us, who came alongside and showed us mercy, who showed us compassion. That's no longer the question. That's no longer the answer. The answer is go and do likewise. Go and show mercy. Go and show compassion to those who are hurting, to those who are left on the side of the road, to those who are half dead and dying. Go and show mercy and compassion. Because the truth is, we're all hurting. We've all been in a place where we're on the side of the road, where we needed some help, where we needed some mercy. We just wanted a little compassion. We've all carried around at least a sack of stones. Or maybe it's one big stone. And we're carrying it around, and we don't know what to do with it. But here's the truth. It's the truth that Jesus tells in, in, to his disciples, and he makes it clear in this parable that the kingdom of God has come near. And it's the role of the church, it's the role of the Samaritan, it's the role of each and every one of us as followers of Jesus Christ to do the same. To come near. To be a very real presence to those who are hurting, who are in need, who are broken, fractured, sinful. And we're all carrying that sack. So we all need, the world needs neighbors. That's what Jesus understood. And he tells it to his disciples, and he tells it to the lawyer, and he tells it to us. The world 
is your neighbor because the world is hurting. The world needs mercy. The world craves compassion. Go and do likewise. Give mercy. Give compassion to all who need it. And as we travel down the road, we don't have to look far for somebody who's hurting. We can just watch the news on any normal day and see a world in pain, see communities in pain, see homes, families, individuals hurting in pain, in need of compassion, in need of mercy. Go and do likewise. So maybe the upside down truth of this parable is not just to see who's coming to help us, but to see who we're going to go help. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite us to stand for our affirmation of faith that is printed in your order of worship. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now remember those on our circle of concern and all of those who may be dealing with sickness and grief this morning. Please join me in our morning prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. God of redemption, you call us to wash ourselves clean so that our transgressions fall away. May we cease doing evil, learn to do good, and seek justice. You call us to rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. May we not forget these responsibilities you set before us so that we can choose and seek to be good neighbors. We are grateful for the reminder from the prophet Isaiah that through that though our sins are like scarlet, you will make us like snow. May we be obedient and willing followers, pleasing unto you. O oh Lord, please also bless our students and teachers as they begin a new school year. Keep our children safe and encouraged to learn. Help us all be students of your word and let us pray together the way you taught us to pray as we say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our morning offering. And as they make their way forward, I invite us all to hear that it is... A because of the faithfulness and generosity of Ashen Place, we are able to continue to offer worship services and discipleship opportunities each week. And so we thank you for your generosity. Now let us pray. Almighty God, we, with joy, we give you thanks for your many blessings in this life and the gift of each day. Accept and bless this offering of your people. 
so that it may grow your kingdom here on earth, among us, and through us. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Again, I want to say thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning here in the sanctuary and on our virtual platforms. It is great to be back in the house of the Lord and to praise God with you. If you have any questions about Ashland Place, um, you, would, you can certainly contact me um, over the phone or come by the church office anytime during the week, or you can just tap me on the shoulder here as you leave. Um, but so good to have you here. Our hymn of invitation is number 395, and our hymnals will sing verses 1 and 2, Take Time to Be Holy.
It is good to have the choir back. Thank you for being back with us. And now let us receive this benediction. Having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us depart from this hour and this place to be God's people who go in the world to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near. We do that when we offer mercy and compassion as neighbors. Go forth in peace. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.